Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Young America's Foundation for sponsoring this event. Yep, <laughs> round of applause. Um, especially um, Mr. Pat Coyle, just for his leadership. Uh, he's just done great things. Um, they do a lot to promote free speech on uh, America's college campuses and really beyond. So this America, or Young America's um, Foundation event is part of the D'Souza uh, Unchained Lecture Series. It's a unique opportunity for Yale to really showcase its commitment to free speech and intellectual diversity and, uh, yeah, just free opinions on campus. I'm excited, yep. <laughs> one step at a time, one step at a time. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you our special guest speaker for this evening, Mr. Dinesh D'Souza, born in Mumbai, India. Mr. D'Souza came to the U.S. as an exchange student um, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in 1983. Uh, he was a former policy analyst in the Reagan White House, and he also served as a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, Mr. D'Souza's first book, Illiberal uh, Education, publicized the phenomenon of political correctness on college campuses, um, and it became a New York Times bestseller for 15 weeks. Since then, he has had a very prolific career, publishing many books, um, as a filmmaker also. Um, Mr. D'Souza has been named one of America's most influential conservative thinkers by the New York Times Magazine. The World Affairs Council lists him as one of the nation's 500 leading authorities on international issues. Um, we look forward to an evening of respectful discourse, as I mentioned before, um, with such a well-known figure. So please join me in welcoming to this gathering, Mr. Dinesh D'Souza. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wow. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to this. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes and take some questions. Um, there are probably going to be a lot of questions, so I'll try to adopt the motto that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I won't keep you too long. <laughs> now, I want to talk about um, the very peculiar atmosphere that has dominated uh, American politics um, since the election of Trump. A peculiar atmosphere that has metastasized onto the campus uh, and is having the clear effect of corrupting intellectual debate and literally making people dumb. Um, I hope to not only talk about this but actually illustrate it by example, um, this evening. Now, since Trump's election, there's been a whole bunch of issues that have surfaced, none of which have actually been seriously debated. We should be debating tax reform. There really wasn't a tax reform debate. There wasn't really a health care debate. Uh, there's not a whole lot of gun control debate going on. Um, what you essentially have is an incendiary atmosphere in which when people say things, you sort of get violent reactions uh, that are a triumph of sort of attitude and emotion over intelligence. And this has become the governing mode of communication in America today. Uh, I'm going to try to depart from this mode um, and try to throw light on a couple of very important issues that are both in American politics and also very relevant to the campus. So the reason we haven't had real debates on issues is because two cards, two accusations have been flying in the air almost nonstop uh, since November of 2016. The first one is the race card. And the second one, no less inflammatory, is the fascism card. The race card is sort of older. And in fact, for those of us who have been in American politics now for a generation, it has been customary to make the accusation that the Republican Party is the party of bigotry, of racism. And the Democratic Party is the party of civil rights, of, of anti-racism. 
And this was, of course, transferred under Trump. Trump is a racist. The Republican Party now is the party of bigotry. The second accusation is somewhat more novel, uh, and that is that Trump is a fascist. Now, when I say it's more novel, people would, would, would fling this accusation at Reagan, at Bush, Reagan's a fascist, but it was kind of a throwaway line. With Trump, it's intended. Uh, and it's intended uh, not only as an insult, but it's intended to justify a whole series of behaviors that would otherwise be unacceptable. So for example, let's boycott the inauguration. Now if Republicans boycotted Obama's inauguration, you can imagine the reaction. Let's violently disrupt the inaugural parties. Uh, let's block speakers on campus. Let's try to get Trump out of there by any means necessary. Let's get him on obstruction of justice, whether or not there was an underlying crime. Now, as I say, this kind of extremism uh, is only justified if America today is sort of like Germany in 1933. If, in fact, Trump is a kind of Hitler, then it might be warranted to use extreme tactics, not excluding violence, uh, in order to prevent what might be even greater catastrophes in the future. So what I want to do is actually beg the question. I want to probe right into it and ask, what is racism? What is fascism? Um, and are these ideologies, if we can call them that, on the left or on the right. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about fascism, um, uh, because fascism is actually a topic that is hardly understood at all. When people talk about fascism, they define it in a way that makes absolutely no sense. Trump is a fascist because he's an ultra-nationalist. He wants to make America great again. Hey, didn't Hitler want to make Germany great again? This is the argument. But it's not really an argument because nationalism has never been a core defining feature of fascism. It is an attribute of it, but it's not a defining feature of it. And in fact, nationalism is equally present on the left as on the right. Um, Gandhi in India was a nationalist. Mandela in South Africa was a nationalist. So was Che Guevara. So was Fidel Castro. All the anti-colonial leaders were ultra-nationalists. Nkrumah in Ghana, for example, many others. Winston Churchill was a nationalist, as was de Gaulle. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a nationalist, as were the American founders. Now, it is beyond stupid to refer to all these people as fascists. They obviously weren't. So nationalism does not actually define who is or is not a fascist. Well, um, Trump is, um, is a fascist because he is an authoritarian. He wants to throw out the Constitution. He wants to end the demo democratic system. By the way, this argument is literally made by pundits on MSNBC, on CNN. It's literally made by comedians on every platform. And these are people who are accusing Trump of being an authoritarian when any real authoritarian would have shut them up in five minutes. Mussolini would have sent a bunch of goons down to the New York Times and beaten those guys to a pulp. But the very fact that Trump is flayed every day in every platform uh, for being an authoritarian kind of proves that he, can't, he isn't. Uh, because he isn't doing anything to the people who are making these accusations. So right away we see that we have to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, and, and I, and I want to suggest that the reason that we don't know a whole lot about these topics is partly because if we did, the whole debate would change instantly. For example, it is not widely known that the founder of fascism, the, the, the first fascist regime in the world was not, was not Nazi Germany, it was Mussolini's Italy, established in 1922. Now Mussolini was a man of the left. He was in fact the most famous Marxist in Italy, perhaps alongside Gramsci. Mussolini and Gramsci were both admired by the Soviet 
socialists. In fact, Mussolini was admired by Lenin. When Mussolini started the first fascist party, Lenin sent a telegram of congratulations. Why? Because he recognized that Mussolini was a fellow revolutionary of the left. And uh, fascism grew out of the crisis of Marxism. In other words, the Marxists had realized that, they, that the, the predictions of Marx, the expectations of a, of a proletarian revolution, were not occurring. They hadn't happened anywhere. And in trying to think about why, Mussolini came up with the idea that perhaps it is because people are less attached to their class than they are to their country. Mussolini noticed in World War I, for example, that the French socialists fought for France and the British socialists fought for Britain. And so Mussolini, in a sense, created national socialism. National socialism. It's a variation of socialism that does not displace class, but simply adds the idea of the nation. Now, Hitler, as we all know, was the head of a party called the National Socialist German Workers Party. Amazingly, if you read commentary today, there's a, almost a, a sort of comical effort to remove the socialism from National Socialism, to pretend as if the National Socialists weren't really socialists, even though all their leading champions not only Hitler, but Goebbels, for example. Goebbels says, between nationalism and socialism, there has to be a priority. Which comes first, the nationalism or the socialism? Answer, he says, socialism. Socialism is the noun, and nationalism, national is the adjective. National qualifies what type of socialism we're trying to do. Now. All of this is camouflaged today because in World War II, we saw the communists on this side and the fascists on this side, thus lending credence to the idea that if the communists were on the left, the fascists must have been on the right. This is actually a complete non sequitur. Let's remember that ideologies that are very close to each other, that are almost, you may say, kissing cousins, have had fratricidal and genocidal wars that have lasted for decades, if not for centuries. Consider the Shia and the Sunni. The Shia and the Sunni are both inside the House of Islam. They differ only by a hair in actual theological beliefs. And yet, the Shia and the Sunni have been fighting and at it for a long time, fighting not only over fine points of theology, but over territory and over power. Over power. So, fascism. The word fascism literally refers to a bunch of sticks tightly bound together. And fascism in its core meaning means simply collectivism, the power of the centralized state. That is the indisputable meaning of fascism. This meaning was fully recognized by the fascists and by the anti-fascists. So for example, in the 1930s, FDR was a huge admirer of Mussolini. FDR saw Italian fascism as, on the left, he knew that, and more progressive than the New Deal. FDR sent members of his brain trust to fascist Rome to study Italian fascism to bring some of those ideas to America. Mussolini, for his part, reviewed FDR's book called Looking Forward in an Italian magazine, and his review can be summarized in this way. This guy is one of us, he's a fascist. So there was a mutual admiration society between the New Deal Democrats and the Italian fascists in the early 1930s. But now I want to get a little more serious uh, and talk about Hitler. And in doing this, I'm actually going to refer very specifically to the work of two very prominent scholars who are right here at Yale. The first is James Whitman uh, in a book that he published uh, very recently called Hitler's American Model. And the other is Timothy Snyder, a prominent historian here at Yale. I'm going to start with Whitman's book. 
where he describes in, its, in, in the opening of the book a meeting in 1935 of the Nazis, the leading Nazis who are in the process of drafting the Nuremberg Laws. And the Nuremberg Laws were the laws that made Jews into second-class citizens. They prohibited intermarriage between Jews and other Germans. They confiscated Jewish property. Uh, they involved all kinds of uh, segregation of Jews into ghettos uh, and also state-sponsored discrimination against Jews. And as the Nazis are in this meeting, they had a stenographer present because they thought they were starting the world's first racist state. One of the Nazis who had studied in America essentially put his hand up, metaphorically speaking, and said, sorry, we can't start the world's first racist state because the Democratic Party in the United States has already done it. And the Nazis were like, what? They looked at each other. Um, and this Nazi explained that in the Democratic South, and I should pause here to make an observation because the Nazis happen to know something that we don't know because it's not in our textbooks. And that is that every segregation law in the Jim Crow South, going back to the 1880s and continuing through the 1950s and 60s, without exception, was passed by a Democratic legislature, signed by a Democratic governor, and enforced by Democratic officials. The Nazis knew this, but you might notice it is somewhat downplayed in the American textbooks of the 21st century. So the Nazis go, all we have to do is take the Democratic laws, cross out the word black, write in the word Jew, and we are off to the races. We're home free. And this is what the Nazis actually did. In other words, what I'm saying is not that there was a surface resemblance between the democratic laws and the Nazi laws. What I'm saying is, and I'm citing Professor Whitman in my defense, he says that the Nazis lifted, took as a blueprint the laws of the Jim Crow South. Now. Here's something very interesting. One might expect Professor Whitman's book to be called Hitler's Democratic Model. But it's not. It's called Hitler's American Model. In other words, what Professor Whitman does is he puts the blame not on the Democratic Party, which actually passed the laws, but on America in general. Now, this makes absolutely no sense because as we all know, going back to the Civil War, America has been divided on issues of slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan. This has been the subject of ongoing battle, sometimes physical battle, between the two parties. But what I'm trying to say is that in some sense, what seems to be going on here is an e there's an effort to cast the blame on America as a whole whereas these actual offenses were perpetrated by some Americans while other Americans tried to stop them. Timothy Snyder has a very important book called Bloodlands in which drawing on other historical scholarship, he makes a second observation, which is he points out that Hitler got his idea for conquering in Europe, in Europe, from the Jacksonian Democrats in the United States. Again, I pause for a moment because this will s strike you, or some of you, as being pretty far out. It is never told or taught to us, not only in our textbooks, but either in, even in the media, that the Nazis actually derived important ideas from progressives and from Democrats in the United States. We don't learn this, we're never told it, but it's true. It's true. Basically, Hitler's problem was that he wanted to compete with the English and the French, and he noticed that the English and the French had colonized most of the world. They already had taken most of the real estate there was to be had. And so Hitler, sitting in Landsberg prison, was like, where is the real estate for Germany to conquer? And then Hitler remembered. Hitler was actually a big fan of Western novels, he studied the United States and he read others who reported on the United States and he remembered that in the 19th century the Jacksonian Democrats had taken the American Indians, flung them off their land, 
killed the ones that resisted, tried to enslave the ones who remained. And Hitler said, I think I'm gonna do that. I don't have to go to Asia. I don't have to conquer India or Africa. I'm gonna stay right here in Europe. I'm gonna throw the Poles and the Russians and the Slavs and the Eastern Europeans. I'll drive them off their land. If they resist, we'll kill them. If they stay back, we'll enslave them. And we will loot their possessions and their land so that Germany can prosper. So once again, what Professor Snyder points out is that Hitler actually used the American example, in this case, the example of the 19th century Democratic Party. But once again, the blame is not placed on the Democrats. It's placed on America in general. America is culpable. Now, I've said a couple things about fascism. I could talk about the Nazi sterilization laws and the Nazi euthanasia laws. I won't go into that, that because of time. But here's what I want to say. In the fascism debate, as in the race debate, important truths that we should know, that should actually govern the debate, are suppressed. In other words, it's very sad that we live in a time not only of fake news. I don't care about fake news. But I do care about fake history. I do care about fake scholarship. And I do, I do care about bogus narratives that camouflage what's actually happened in this country. When I um, released the movie Hillary's, Hillary's America last year, I'd been speaking on many campuses, and typically when I would talk about slavery, and make the point that the secession debate was between the North and the South, but the slavery debate was between a pro-slavery Democratic Party and an anti-slavery Republican Party. In other words, the Democrats of the North were equally complicit as the Democrats of the South in protecting slavery as an institution. That's the key point. Uh, inevitably, some pompous professor would stand up and say, well, Dinesh, uh, your comments, although true in and of themselves, are a wee bit simplistic. Uh, you have to realize that there's plenty of blame to go around. We can't simply fault one party or the other party. Both parties were, you might say, accessories to the historical crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And whenever I hear this, this to me is the proverbial squid-like cloud of rhetoric that it's very important to dissipate because it's actually intended to muddy the waters, not to clarify things. And so in Hillary's America, I decided, let me push the envelope and make a categorical scientific statement, scientific in the sense that it's eminently refutable. And so I did. In 1860, the year before the Civil War, I said, no Republican owned a slave. Not no Republican leader owned a slave, but no Republican in the United States owned a slave. All the slaves in the entire country, four million of them, were owned by Democrats. Now, this statement, I want to tell you, appears in no history book no textbook. It has never, been, never appeared to my knowledge in an article. It has never been uttered by anyone on television or on the History Channel or in a documentary. And yet, as I say, it's eminently refutable. All you have to do is give me the names of five Republicans who own slaves, and I would have to take it back. But to this day and to this moment, not a single counterexample has ever been provided. Not one. One PhD researcher wrote me several months ago, and he said, I got you, Dinesh, I got you. Ulysses S. Grant inherited a slave on his wife's side, a solitary slave. And I pointed out to him, I said, that was almost a touche, my friend, but you've got to remember that at the time this happened, Ulysses S. Grant was a Democrat. <laughs> Only later did he move over into the Republican column. Now, I mention this because this is actually History. It's indisputable. It's in the record. Uh, Professor Whitman has the transcripts of the Nuremberg meetings. So the question I want to ask is, why don't we, educated people in America, know this stuff? Why is it the case that when you turn on the television, there's Rachel Maddow, there's Van Jones, <laughs> there are all these guys bloviating about fascism, without the slightest clue about what fascism is, 
without any knowledge of the deep, intimate connections between American progressivism on the one hand and the actual real-life fascists on the other. And so here we are in the middle of what may be called a big lie, a big lie. And what is a big lie? Well, we know what a small lie is. A small lie is a easily verifiable untruth. If somebody tells you something that is false, you can check it out. The problem with big lies is that they're so big that you can't get your head around them. And therefore, they're much harder to refute. It's much easier to sell a big lie than a small lie. What happened in America, very sadly, this distortion about fascism did not start with Trump. The big lie about Trump actually began in 1945. The moment that American soldiers went into the concentration camps, the moment they saw those ghostly, emaciated, tottering figures come out, the moment fascism was permanently discredited and Nazism, immediately something else began at the same time. Progressive revisionism. Progressive revisionism. The progressives coming to power in, in the 1940s in the academy, in the media, in Hollywood, basically said, we cannot afford to let future generations know what fascism actually is. We have to reinvent fascism. We've got to create, if you will, a new fascism. And we've got to move fascism from the left-wing column, where it's always been into the right-wing column, so we can now use it as a bludgeon against our opponents. This is the biggest of the big lies. And it is no less true, I'm sorry to say, of racism than of fascism. Just want to make one uh, point, uh, one more point before I move to my conclusion. It is widely believed by many people that the civil rights movement of the 1960s was effectuated, was passed by the Democratic Party. And some people believe with the resistance of the Republican Party. This is actually not true. In fact, it is the opposite of the truth. In fact, more Republicans proportionally voted for all the civil rights laws, by which I mean the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Bill of 1968, than Democrats. The opposition to civil rights came from the Democratic Party. And if the Congress had had no Republicans, only Democrats, none of these laws would have passed. Now, that is a fact. And again, it is a fact easily verifiable. We live in this wonderful age of technology where you don't have to take my word for it. You can look it up. But then the moment I say this on campus, people say to me, well, Dinesh, but don't you know there was a big switch? The party swapped sides. The Republicans became Democrats. The Democrats became Republicans. I'm like, really? You mean like the cops became robbers? The robbers became cops? When did that actually occur? How would that even be possible? Did they actually exchange platforms? So the argument here basically is that the racist Democrats, the infamous Dixiecrats, the people who, for example, broke with Strom Thurmond in 1948, who voted against the Civil Rights Act, these Dixiecrats, these racist Dixiecrats, became Republicans. Except they never did. Except that this is itself a big lie, and it is the easiest lie to check. I simply made a list of all the Dixiecrats. In the Senate, there are about 35 of them. In the Congress, about 100 of them. You add in the governors, it's a group of about 200. 200 racist Dixiecrats. Let's count how many of them moved over to the Republican Party? Answer, one. One guy, Strom Thurmond. Nobody else. Everybody else remained in the Democratic Party and was lionized for it. When Robert Byrd, former Ku Klux Klansman, died in 2010, there was Obama at his funeral. There was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton actually addressed the fact that Robert Byrd was in the Ku Klux Klan. He goes, let me tell you why Robert Byrd was in the Klan. You had to be in the Klan in those days in order to get ahead in the Democratic Party. Kind of an eye-opening statement. You had to be in the Klan. That was the only way to get ahead. Now, now we have all these Antifa guys crawling out of their mom's basements, putting on their black outfits, looking for their missing bike locks, right? 
and going around knocking over monuments. Let's, get, let's go get Robert E. Lee. Well, Robert E. Lee, why don't you go get Robert Byrd? Half of West Virginia is named after Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd Highway, Robert Byrd School, Robert Byrd Medical Center. Robert Byrd is untouched. The Senate Russell Building. There are huge buildings in America named after Democratic racists and segregationists who are never touched by Antifa, never attacked by the progressive left. Standing in Chicago is a huge monument to Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas was the leader of the Northern Democratic faction that was pro-slavery. When Lincoln described what he called the four, the four men for slavery, we can call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, he named Roger Tawney, who signed the Dred Scott decision. He was a Southerner, although from Maryland. The other three guys, Pierce, Buchanan, and Stephen Douglas, all Northern Democrats. The point I'm trying to make is that what we have seen now is a very interesting uh, move in progressive scholarship to lift the blame off the Democratic Party and pin it on the South, pin it on America, but take it off the actual party that explicitly said, we are the party of the white man. We are the party of slavery. What I'm trying to say is that the Democrats invented the doctrine of white supremacy. So the very people who poisoned the wells are today magically showing up as the water commissioner. <laughs> We're here to fix the problem. What problem? Well, the problem we created. And, and this is the missing landscape of the American race debate and the fascism debate. So I come full circle. You would like to see, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that we're discussing racism or fascism. It's a good thing on the balance. We should be discussing other things too, but we should be discussing these things also. But my objection is to the dishonest, um, intellectually shameful, um, degraded way in which these topics are discussed or very often not discussed. Uh, so for example, as I mentioned on CNN, places like this, you have all these pundits who talk about fascism. I publish a book about fascism, The Big Lies, a detailed examination of fascism. You would think these guys would love to have it out uh, in an argument on Rachel Maddow's show to discuss who's the real fascist. Is it Trump or is it Hillary? In fact, they won't touch this kind of topic. They would like to have some buffoon on that they can, that they, who knows nothing about the topic that they can make fun of, but if somebody actually knows what they're talking about, no, de no desire to have a conversation with that guy. And this, I'm afraid, also extends to, to intellectual academic debate. Our professors, I don't name names, but it's true in general, are scared to debate. They say things, but they won't stand up behind them. They rely on their own hospitable crowd of well-wishers to endorse what they say, amplify it. Uh, they want Michael Moore to make a movie on it, and they want, they, want to, they want to be in the New York Review of Books. But they won't stand up man to man in intellectual debate and allow their ideas to be tested in the manner that John Stuart Mill said we should have if we're going to come towards something approximating truth. So ultimately, to me, it's not about Trump. It's ultimately about free speech, but not just free speech. People say, well, we gotta protect your right to to say these things. I don't actually care about my right to say these things. I care about what I'm actually saying. I care about the merits of what I'm actually saying, and I'm actually inviting people to challenge me, not on whether the First Amendment is good or not, but whether or not it's true that fascism is and always has been on the left. So I leave you with the thought that I don't expect you in a, in a single talk where I introduce a lot of new things to agree with me just by hearing me. I invite you to check them out, investigate for yourself, actually read Mussolini was a prolific author, for example. He wrote innumerable scholarly articles. He edited a, uh, the socialist journal called Avanti. Read his work and ask yourself, is this a man of the left or is this a man of the right? Make your own decision. That's ultimately, I think, what education is all about. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. D'Souza. Um, so we'll have time for some questions. So if anybody has a question, what I'll have you do is we'll have a line here. Um, if you're over there, if you could make your way kind of horseshoe around. Um, I'll have the microphone, ask your question, keep it brief, one question a person, and uh, yeah, feel free to come up. We'll also just give priority to Yale students, so if you want to jump to the front of the line. <coughs> Privilege. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> That's why I'm oh. sending you right up. Right on the X. Okay. Stand on the X. Uh, okay. Uh, I can't hold the microphone? Nope. Right. Okay. Uh, hey, um, so I, I have a couple of questions, but I, I'm, I'll defer to you as to how many I can ask. Um, yep, just one. <laughs> just the one. Okay. So, you, so you, I, I think you rightly mentioned the, the, the fascist and racist behavior of, of Andrew Jackson. Um, and but in a comparison to Trump, Trump has been the, the president in recent memory who's been most complimentary of Andrew Jackson. Um, just from memory, I believe he's asked for his uh, asked for him to remain on on currency notes. Has said that he is uh, that the Jackson's legacy has been unfairly maligned in the history of the Civil War. Um, I believe he also said that uh, had Jackson been around, the Civil War wouldn't have happened because he'd have dealt with it or something uh, to the, of this nature. I, I mean, I think. If you were to draw a line between Jacksonian, uh, the, the Jacksonian Democratic Party and fascism, which I think is legitimate, you should also draw a line between that legacy and the legacy of Jackson that Trump seeks to, uh, well, I, I don't know if glorify is the right word, but, but certainly more complimentary to it than uh, recent presidents have been. This is a case where, um, this is a case where Trump is absolutely wrong and I'm absolutely right. Um, <laughs> Now, the question I have to ask is, how did Trump become so deluded about Andrew Jackson? And the answer is, he went to the Jackson Presidential Library. I don't know if you've ever been to a presidential library. I was at the Clinton Library several years ago. If you walk into the Clinton Library in Arkansas, you will see on the wall, right as you walk in, data about, it says things like this. In 1992, only 3% of Americans owned a cell phone. In 2000, this is when Clinton left office, it was 68%. And this kind of data is all given on the wall and, 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 and silhouetted against this is a large, beaming, smiling, credit-taking uh, image of Bill Clinton, essentially taking a bow and saying, I did all this, I did all this. Now, I mention this not to, not to uh, ridicule Clinton, but because this is the mode of the presidential library, unadulterated, shameless propaganda. If you go to the Nixon Library in Whittier, uh, California, I assure you that when you walk out of it, even though you've listened to the Watergate tapes, Nixon railing against the Jews and all this stuff, you'll come out and you'll say, that Nixon was a great man, <laughs> was a great man. And so Trump, this is not his area, um, <laughs> Uh, I have to say, thinks that Andrew Jackson is, was a tough guy, was a patriot, was his guy. There were good things about Andrew Jackson, I won't deny that, but there were a lot of very bad things about Jackson as well. And on the balance, on the balance, I think that the founder of the Democratic Party was an all-around bad guy. Can I respond to that briefly at all? No, next question. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry for my heavy accent first. Um, I am a recent immigrant uh, to this country. And when we come here, all we see at the local, uh, state, and federal level, all the black people are Democrats, including Mr. Obama. And what you are saying, if it is true, then how all these black intellectuals we consider and we look up to, are they all ignorant and they don't know what? Because wha from what you say, the Democrats are not friend of the slave black Amer uh, Africans. So I was wondering, are they really that uh, uh, ignorant? This is a very, this is the kind of question that, that I like a lot because it actually <coughs> pursues the premise that I put forward. If it is true that the Democratic Party was the party of slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, racial terrorism, the Ku Klux Klan, I assert that all of that is true. And why would it be that A, this fact would be downplayed, even by African-American scholars, and B, 
why would they still be unapologetically loyal to the Democratic Party? Um, now, this is a very complicated question. I, I won't do full justice to it here. I'm actually writing about this now. But let me say a couple things. Ask yourself this question. It is true that African Americans as a group did move over from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. 90% of African Americans today vote Democratic. Here's the question. When did that shift occur? The general assumption is it must have occurred sometime in the 1960s because Lyndon Johnson pushed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. African Americans now realize that the Democrats are our friends. Let's move over to the Democratic Party. But it turns out that this is, even though plausible, is actually not what happened. Blacks moved over to the Democratic Party in the 1930s. In, in 1932, Hoover got two-thirds of the black vote. But by 1936, two-thirds of the black vote went to FDR. In four years. In four years, blacks flipped from the, Democratic, from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Now, amazingly, at this time, the Democratic Party was explicitly the party of segregation and the Ku Klux Klan. So blacks left the party of Lincoln and joined the party of the KKK in the 30s. Why did they do it? Well, the obvious answer to it, but it's not the answer that the progressives want to hear, is it was the economic promises of the New Deal. It was the heart of the Depression. Blacks lived in terrible circumstances. I don't fault them for a minute. But what I am saying is it was the economic benefits of the New Deal. Many New Deal programs were segregated. Many of them excluded blacks. But even so, the crumbs that FDR offered were apparently enough to convince a very downtrodden group to switch its political allegiances. So the reason this story is not known, it doesn't fit the narrative. Blacks are supposed to be finding their civil rights friends in the Democratic camp. That's not what happened. So what I'm getting at is to ferret out the true story of America takes a little bit of work, but it takes a lot of intellectual bravery. And that intellectual bravery is really scarce in America today. You know, when someone like me stands up to say these things in a campus like Yale, we always have to wor worry, are we going to be allowed to speak? If we are allowed to speak, will we be shouted down? If we're not shouted down, will we be summarily dismissed without any effort to, I mean, I've put at least half a dozen very powerful facts on the table in just 30 minutes. Either I'm right or I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, show me. I'm a, as public a figure as you're going to find. It's going to be very easy to expose my facts as flawed on social media or anywhere else. No one does. No one does. And so what I'm suggesting is we have to go back to the drawing board. We have to re-examine. I'm an immigrant, as you are. Um, when I first came to America, I went to Washington, D.C. in the 80s. I went to a reception by uh, uh, now Senator Schumer. He was then a congressman from New York. And um, he, it's a bunch of us Asian Indians. And he made a very interesting statement. He said, you Asian Indians, he goes, you never ask for anything. He goes, you just come to America, you work hard, you try to move ahead. He goes, you don't understand that that's why we're here. The Democratic Party is here so that you can make demands of us and we will deliver for you in exchange for your vote. So I listened to this and I was like, could this really, is he actually saying this? But he was. He was actually offering the deal that the Democratic Party offers not just blacks, every ethnic group. They basically say, we, will, we want you to come together as a group. This is, by the way, why the Democrats are so big on race matters, because they need to, to have each minority group hang together, because they, want to, they don't want to convince them individually. They want to get them as a group. And, and the politics of the Democrats are the politics of ethnic identity. Let's get the blacks, they're 12%. Let's get the Latinos, they're 13%. That's 25 right there. If we get the Asians, that's another five. Then we're already at 30. We only have to get to 51. Maybe we'll get some feminists. Maybe we'll get some gay rights activists. Whoops, there we are. We've got a majority. So it is not a politics of the common good. It is a politics of cobbling together ethnic coalitions in order to loot the rest of the population. <laughs> Once I figured that out, I had to exit.
Hello, so I apologize, but I want to jump a bit off topic. Okay. Um, so based on the occurrence that just happened in Florida with the mass shooting, um, Donald Trump had said that he was wanting to arm the teachers. I was wondering if you had agreed with that, and if you don't agree with it, then what would be your solution in that case? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I um, um, made a, a mistake myself in a tweet that I did myself about the Parkland students. It was in the heat of social media, and social media, I think you know, is somewhat something of the Wild West. <laughs> And so here we are in, in, in the social media debate, the give and take of Twitter. And, you know, here I'm turning on Twitter and I see, you know, this, this student uh, is being coached by the CNN producer. He keeps stopping when he's speaking. They keep telling him what to say. They drag him down. So then I see a meme of the Florida legislature voting on, on a gun ban. Uh, and I see the students magically appear there uh, and reacting to this legislation. So anyway, I, I, I did a sarcastic tweet basically saying, gee, you know, um, uh, this is the worst news they've heard since their parents made them get summer jobs. <laughs> Insensitive, I must admit. Um, and uh, because my target was the manipulation of the students and not the students. But, but that's, that was a case where I basically um, uh, missed my target, you know. Um, now, ironically, the gun issue is not my main issue. And I, I'm not, you know, since I'm not running for office, I don't have to, I don't actually have solutions to all the world's problems. I try to focus on things I actually know about. I don't know a lot about guns. Um, I don't know what, how, what an AR-15 does. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea to arm teachers or not. Um, I have instincts about things, um, and, um, um, and I, I'm quick to spot hypocrisy in arguments. In other words, I've been hearing now for 20 years that you can't outlaw abortion, for example, because people will still go and get an illegal abortion. They're going to get it. They're going to do it. But somehow that logic is never applied to guns. You can't outlaw guns because people are going to go out and get a gun. I say to myself, in this case, in the Parkland case, um, we know that the FBI got some tips about this guy. We know that there were sheriff's deputies on the scene. So here we have. We have the FBI. We have the sheriff's deputies. We have, let's say, the NRA. Now, which of these three were in a position to prevent the shooting? The first one. Which was in a position to actually disrupt it and stop it? The second. The third has the least to do with it and is, in fact, by and large, as far as I can see, been a pretty responsible advocate for responsible gun ownership. And yet, the political blame is all falling on three. So we're in a very peculiar situation where we're blaming inanimate objects, the gun, when there are actual, there's actual flagrant violations of human responsibility, which are eminently correctable if we would actually use it. So my, that's my take on the Parkland situation. I'm sorry I did the tweet. I apologize for it. I take it back. Uh, but these are my thoughts about the issue in a nutshell. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Dinesh, I want to thank you a lot for being here. Um, so I've noticed that when leftists like to argue about things like evolution and climate change, which granted a lot of people on the right agree with that stuff too, they, off they always use the claim like, well, it's because of science. You guys are science deniers. But then when it comes to like transgender stuff and abortion, people, the left completely abandons science and biology and they just go for emotion and feelings. When, you know, the facts are there, you know, there are males and females that, you know, what's inside the mother is in fact a human, but the left just goes for it, that's a person's choice. Or you can't tell someone that that person's not a male if, he, if she identifies as a male. I was just wondering what your take on that is. I do think that, that um, science is, it's not new that science is being ideologically deployed. That's actually been going on for a long time. Um, I think what's new is the, um, is the political correctness of it. So for example, if you're a climate scientist who dissents from the prevailing orthodoxy, they'll try to make sure you, you don't get a grant. They'll try to make sure that you can't be at the Rand Corporation. Uh, they'll try to make sure that if, you, if you're publishing a book, they'll contact Oxford University Press and tell them not to publish your book. Now, that is, that is a whole new level of dangerous. 
you know, because when people do that, and when people say even, even, even with regard to my tweet, you know, people are like, let's make sure that this guy doesn't speak anywhere. Let's make sure that this guy, so I'm saying to myself, that's not even the second amendment. Now we're talking about the first amendment. So, so to me, science is not free of public policy debate. It should be debated. Um, but you're right, there are double standards uh, that are blatantly employed in which science is convenient when it's used exactly. and then completely ignored in other areas. It's almost as if, see, I think what's happened in our society is that there's a new sense of identity um, which is seen as, as subjective that trumps biological reality. It's almost as if there is a me apart from me that gets to adjudicate what and who I am. It's a very strange idea if you think about it. Um, but it's an, it's an idea that's been brewing in America for a while. Um, it's even behind, like when I go talk to my dad and tell him, hey dad, I don't want to go to business school, I want to become a writer. What do I appeal to? I appeal to this inner me, you know, this sort of, uh, this sort of inner self uh, as the final adjudicator of which way I should go. Um, these ideas are very American, but we should, but reflecting on them uh, intellectually is part of what we should do on a campus. Thank okay? You. All right. Thank you. Uh, due to the time, this will be the, the last question. So, yep. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for coming out, uh, especially to a campus where a lot of people disagree with you. But I have to say, like, I'm one of the people who's probably, like, disagrees on, with you on a bunch of stuff. Uh, and I wanted to ask about, um, so basically a lot of your arguments seem to be based in history and the idea that um, fascism is historically rooted in, on left wing left wing side. Um, but you don't say anything about how that reflects on the current day. And there was a point where you mentioned like Hillary Clinton's fascism, but you didn't really talk about uh, the fascism on the left today. And I feel like that would be a stronger argument. And can you say anything about that? Certainly. Actually, what, what a fantastic question. Um, it's one thing to talk about racism historically. Where's the racism now? It's one thing to talk about fascism historically. Where's the fascism now? All right. So let me, um, uh, let me point to two um, fascist modes that are on the left, very visible, right in front of us. Um, the first is ideological, and the second is tactical. OK, so let's start with the ideology. Um, what is the meaning of fascist economics? So the fascists were socialists. But they were a very special type of socialists. The fascists believed that instead of the government nationalizing the corporations, which is basically what socialism does, socialist countries like India would nationalize the banks or nationalize the airlines or nationalize the energy sector and so on. The fascist solution was, was different. The fascist solution was, we'll let the companies stay private, but we will have the government control them. The government will be like a quarterback uh, or a muscle man directing these companies as to what to do. And it'll be, so state regulation of private business was the <coughs> fascist mode of socialism. Now, interestingly, in the Obama era over the last eight years, we have seen essentially the federal government take control of the banks, the investment sector, uh, largely the energy industry through the EPA, um, uh, the healthcare industry, every hospital, every hospice. Now again, we have private insurance companies, but the way this worked is that Obama got them into a room and strong-armed them. He said, listen, I'm gonna take you over and you're not gonna like that, but I have a sweetener for you. I'm going to force tens of millions of Americans who don't wanna buy health insurance to buy it. And that's gonna mean untold profits for you guys. So you need to buy ads supporting my program, which is what the health insurance companies did. So this was the dirty racket called Obamacare. But my point is not even to complain about the racket, but to point to the fascist element of it, the idea of government control of the private sector. I mean, here's Obama firing the head of General Motors. Only in a fascist country does the president of a, of, of a democracy get to fire the head of a private corporation. So, that, so that's ideological fascism in the economic sense. Now we turn to tactics. And many people, when I say this, expect me to say Antifa. And again, it's not Antifa. Um, the most dangerous guy in Berkeley is not Antifa. It's the mayor of Berkeley, Jesse Aragon. He's the guy who has the power to call off the cops. 
the real fascism that we're seeing today in America is the use of the instruments of the federal government against political opponents. That's pure fascism. In other words, if I'm the president and I'm able to use the FBI, the CIA, the Justice Department, the, if I'm going to mobilize SWAT teams to go after, to audit, to arrest, to lock up people who don't agree with me, this use of the state, thoroughly undemocratic, is classically fascist. Now, Trump's not doing this. Trump's not, but increasingly, there's creeping evidence that the left is. I'll just give you a tiny example from my own case, because I'm going to talk about what I actually know. The Congressional Oversight Committee has a copy in their hands of my file. And this is my case in the Obama administration for exceeding campaign finance laws. Did I exceed campaign finance laws? Yes. But no American has ever been locked up for eight months for doing it, right? Now, when you open up my file, you see in it, highlighted, D'Souza is a prominent critic of the Obama administration and made a movie very critical of Obama. And so even though my case involved $20,000, the FBI on its own assigned $100,000 to investigate my $20,000 case. That's abnormal. So when you see the government jumping in to target somebody, and they say it, in part at least because he is an opponent of our team, that's bad news. Even liberals should be up in arms about that. But in fact, I don't have any liberal defenders. Why? Because to them, I'm an anti-Obama guy, I'm an Obama critic, and the less we see of you, the better. So we're in this gangsterish mode in American politics. Uh, I came of age in the 80s, in the Reagan era. And while Reagan and Tip O'Neill were, were fierce adversaries, they'd go out for a beer afterward. I mean, they could ultimately say, we disagree. I care about this, you care about that. Let's meet in the middle. That politics is gone from America, and I mourn it. I think it's a pity that it's gone. But I find myself in this new environment and having to fight in it. So there's no point in nostalgically hearkening back to Reaganism. We have to actually surf on the wave. We have to swim in the water that we're given, and we have to hope for a better day uh, in America in the future. So thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, know this. Everybody else has been canonizing Senator Byrd. I'd like to humanize him a little bit. Because I think it makes him more interesting and makes his service all the more important. There are a lot of people who wrote these eulogies for Senator Byrd in the newspapers, and I read a bunch of them. And they mentioned that he once had a fleeting association with the Ku Klux Klan, and what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. He was a country boy from the hills and hollows of West Virginia. He was trying to get elected. He was trying to get elected. He was trying to get elected.